Hello, friends. Welcome back to Five Agendas. Just open with a word of prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We enter again upon the domain of the divine holy ground. We take off our shoes and we ask you to teach us and guide us by your spirit. And help us to understand. We are weak and sinful. And we know that without you, we can do nothing. But with you, we can do all things. Take us. We're yours. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So I just came across something the other day that I'd share real quick. That is... This picture, okay, some of you will be familiar with. You have the 2300 days, but here's the, um, the interpretation we were brought up with, taught, or have, pre or have held for however long. So here we've got the 538 AD to 1798. See here you have the 20, 1260 days, 42 months and three and a half years. From Revelation 11, 12, 13, Daniel 7, which is basically saying that the 42 months in Revelation and the 1260 days in Daniel are the same thing. However, the Bible is saying they are two separate time periods. The one in Daniel 7 and 12, that 1260 being fulfilled from 554 to 1814 with Napoleon's abdication for the five kings that are fallen from Revelation 17. And the 42 months in Revelation are a future apotelismatic a second application of the prophecy. But the problem with this is, see, 538 to 1798, we have the 1260 coming before with 538 going up until 1798, and then 1798 being the deadly wound. However, the Bible says here, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and 10 horns, and upon his horns, 10 crowns, and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. See, here we have verse 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and 6, and the Bible has them in this order. And some are saying, well, you know, just because it's in that order doesn't mean that it, you know, takes place in that order. But here's the problem if you say that. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. So you can't have the whole world wondering after the beast before it's the deadly wound and before it's healing. Neither can you have the healing taking place before it's actually wounded. Okay. And again, and they worship the dragon, which gave power to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who's like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Okay, can't have them asking this question and worshiping the dragon and worshiping the beast and asking these questions. Can't have that happening before the deadly wound and its healing and them all wondering after the beast because here in sequential order, it's the deadly wound and then the deadly wound is healed and then they wonder, and they worship and they asked this question, and because of that, there was given unto a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. Okay, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. You can't have the 42 months coming before the deadly wound and the healing. 
okay? Which means you can't have the, the 1260 coming before the deadly wound. Because the Bible says that the 1260, the 42 months, then Revelation 13.5 here, you can't have it coming before. It says it comes after. Okay, so you say if 1798 was still the deadly wound, then you have to have the 1260 days or years coming after 1798. And that's what doesn't make any sense. It doesn't line up. That's when we've had to go, go back to the drawing board and realize that the man in linen, because of Admete, and unto when, and his testimony that the 1290 days ends in 1844, right along with the 2300, we have to have the 1260, um, yes, taking place from 554 to 1844, then um, you've got to have what's this? You have to have the 1260 coming coming after, which means the neither the 1260 in Daniel or Revelation lines up with 538 to 1798. So that's just a little. Um, help for that. Now, this video, we are going to be discussing the thought paper for December 1st, the Elohim Declaration, which is part one. And with some feedback from the field, we're hoping that this new um, doing it this way, this reader view will be a little easier to see on your iPad or computer. Friends, this series is truly inspired and an eye opener. It is groundbreaking research in its findings concerning Revelation 13 and 2211. So, straight up, the Elohim Declaration, what is it? It's in 2211. The Elohim Declaration. Readers who enjoyed the Masterpiece of Divinity series will with precision examine Christ's eternal righteousness and what it means during the 1290 days future. See, which means there's a second application of the 1260, the 1290, and the 1335, which means 508 and 538 are what was said by the messenger of the Lord, a mistake in some of the figures on the chart. And the man in linen has removed his hand. And we can understand that now. So the 1290 days of abomination and desolation, the uniqueness of Revelation 13, 8, Christ, the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world, and that's our abbreviation here, is so important that nothing else should hold our attention. Speaking from my own experience and respect to old and cherished views, come to this with a teachable mindset. Search the scriptures and you'll find a pearl of great price, thereby forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before. As Jesus said, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So the Elohim declaration is about eternal righteousness. The beast counterfeit righteousness to Revelation 13.8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. This seemingly ignored and obscure verse in Revelation 13 presents insights into the Elohim declaration of Revelation 2211. This new series explains the importance of eternal righteousness of he who made and its relation to the three angels' messages. Especially the first angel who says, fear God and worship him that made 
in the everlasting gospel. The lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. The lamb slain from before the foundation of the world is the word who in beginning was with God and was God. The importance of eternal righteousness can never be overstated. The fact the word was with God and was not known as the son of God in eternity is precisely what is superior to the 1888 messengers understanding of the Godhead. Example, the 1888 message of righteousness by faith missed this aspect and this will be discussed. Surprised? Okay, so ask yourself, if both messengers of 1888 General Conference session realized what eternal righteousness of Revelation 13.8 meant, that the word was also eternal, lamb slain from before the foundation of the world, would they have pushed on with an Arian doctrine in their teachings about the Godhead, where they insisted Christ was begotten or emanated back in eternity? Mm -hmm. Would they have realized their mistake as it related to the first angel, which presents two in beginning, and the eternal origins of imputed righteousness? You will see in this series why the two beasts and the mark of the beast is not the focal point of Revelation chapter 13. In fact, at the time of the unfolding of the first beast, okay, and the lamb-like beast, the entire point of why Christ's eternal righteousness demands all of our attention is because of the threefold warning in Revelation 14, the three angels' messages. Always keep in mind the first angel's message is God's plea to worship he who created the heavens and the earth or settle for an imposter. The reason why the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world is worthy, well, it is because he was also eternal. He too was and also had no beginning. Melchizedek without beginning of days or end of life. That is why the Masterpiece of Divinity series is extremely important. The details about imputed righteousness of he who made relates especially to the sealing time of Revelation 7. Imputed righteousness? It's about his righteousness being imputed to us. Okay? So reading the parts in yellow, and again, at any point, this video can be stopped and, and read the por parts that I'll, I'll um, be moving over because this is just, you know, a, a commentary, a highlight of the um, really important bits. Because as always, we encourage to, um, you know, study the thought paper in its entirety. We have to get things straight. Saving faith is not through our own works, but by the faith in Christ and his eternal righteousness. This has major implications as to the substantive truth of the Godhead of salvation and the applications of imputed righteousness, because like Abraham, who by faith was imputed the same eternal righteousness of the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world, you will discover Paul was very aware of its importance, but what exactly is imputed and does this mean some reviewing of some of our pet subjects when it comes to Christ and saving faith, okay? This eternal righteousness of the Lamb, who is also eternal, is what is imputed. And it is a righteousness that existed before the foundation of the world. So in simple language, if Christ was begotten, literally, or born, or birthed, or emanated, or brought forth in eternity, as the pioneers believed from 1888, that he was begotten so far back in the ages of eternity, beyond our comprehension. If that were true, then his righteousness would not be eternal. So the fact that his, his righteousness is eternal, which means had no beginning, 
he also had no beginning. Because in beginning, he was. And the very word was there in the Greek. I'll just turn to it. The word was, uh, new, is a verb in the imperfect tense of expressing to be. Continuous action past time. It describes the word as eternal, that is pre-existent, ever-existent, self-existent. And that's the word was. So, eternal. Okay. It was eternal, just as Christ was eternal. Christ imputes this freely to all. By the smallest faith, it is the basis of why all names recorded are retained in the Lamb's Book of Life. This is the all-absorbing topic at the present time. Well, for a significant factor, okay, as mentioned by Jesus, where he warned of the duration of time known as the abomination of desolation, there, because then, and at his second coming, we cannot stand in our own righteousness or anything else that passes itself off as righteousness. Okay, so there's a time just before us, the AOD, right here, okay, that Jesus spoke of here. And spoke of and referred us to Daniel, okay, who so really let him understand and used that as a sign for the end times. And that's for us. And that's why there's going to be a future second or apotelismatic, second application or interpretation or fulfillment of the prophecy, just like it was in 554 to 1814 for the 1260. There's going to be a future 1260. But in this, this time, it's going to be because you know, the, the end times, you know, aren't going to be 1,260 years. Okay. That wouldn't make any sense. And it can't happen because of Luke 21, 24, the generation that saw Jesus, Jesus's own prophecy, the generation that saw the, you know, in the first application, Jerusalem surrounded, saw Jerusalem destroyed in 70 AD. Okay. So in the second application, all right, the apostolismatic, the generation that saw Jerusalem, okay, um, the beginning that Jerusalem was starting to, you know, the Six-Day War, June 1967, Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem could pass, then know that the desolation there is nigh. And then for the second part, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of Gentiles be fulfilled. So that until, which began that brief period of time designated by that Akrihu, that Greek idiom that Luke used in Luke 21, until 1967, when Jerusalem was no longer trodden down by the nations or Gentiles, when they retook, retook Jerusalem with a six day war of June 1967 up until the time, that brief period of time from 67 to 1980, when they declared Jerusalem the capital of Israel, the generation that saw that didn't pass away. So we're not going to have 1260 literal years. So this gets back to um, rightly dividing the word of truth. So the 1260 in Revelation has to be three and a half years, 1260 days. Okay. Um, Paul qualified eternal righteousness. Second Timothy 1.9, who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. The beast wars against one thing. Eternal righteousness. Wars against him and his eternal righteousness. That's why it's important for you to understand that uh, his righteousness is eternal, which equals he is eternal. 
the word, okay? Because the beast is going to war against this, and he's warring against it, okay? Because there's so much error out there surrounding Christ's eternal righteousness and his eternal um, divinity, deity, dignity, okay? And there was given uh, it to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and there was given to it authority over every tribe and tongue and nation. All right, and bow before it. Shall all who are dwelling upon the land whose names have not been written in the scroll of life of the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. The acceptance to worship of the beast or its image is a deception that will, that will immerse you in the universe consciousness, law of one religion. And there's your links that you can click on and for further study. This teaching opposes the Lamb's true eternal righteousness who existed before the foundation of the world. And keep in mind, the universe, knowledge religion, insists you were perfect in the spirit realm prior to being born and coming to earth. Okay. And here's where you can pause and read some of this because I'm going to skip down here. The dead return to the ground, but with that, there is more deception of the immortal soul doctrine, and this falsehood forms a part of Satan's matrix of what he told the woman in the Garden of Eden, that both her and, her at, and Adam would not die, but that their eyes would be opened and they would understand good and evil. That last statement about good and evil Positively and, and positive possibility thinking is in reference to how the serpent beguiled the woman. She had the taken of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and, and, and believed the, the devil's statement, which makes men and women the arbitrator, arbiter, arbiters of their own destiny. This is a falsehood believed by many today and removes God entirely from salvation. What happens if someone comes up to you and, and starts talking about this? Are you going to be able to answer them? Even though you say you believe God, but it's because you believe you are the arbiter of your own destiny and can unify with the higher consciousness, the spirit that is in reality self-righteousness and strikes hard against the first angel's warning to worship, fear God and worship him that made. Why is eternal righteousness the point of Revelation 13? The central point here, it's because the mystery of iniquity, all right, influences all reading of this chapter. Have you explored the full implications of the mystery of godliness in respect to Revelation 13 8, which is the lamp sign from before the foundation of the world? Have you? I haven't. If you have not, then be sure to pay attention. In Revelation 13, God actually asks readers to consider the mystery of the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world as defined in verse eight. The mystery of iniquity and the mystery of godliness are both mysteries, yet one offers by faith true eternal righteousness since the word knew about the other mystery prior to its arrival since he was God and was with God. Making sense? Well, it all goes back to the perfection mystery of wanting to be like the most high. Remember Isaiah 14, Satan said, I will be like the most high. And with this, Lucifer concocted the matter of an emanation from a, a universal consciousness, soul or mortality as the way of perfection in the flesh. Since the soul is supposedly entombed in a material body, which is a decent, a descent from universal consciousness. All that erroneous unity consciousness and universal one religion and all this is all from the enemy. 
and it points you to self, self-righteousness. The only other thing, only other option you're ha- going to have is Christ's eternal righteousness. And you can't either understand or accept or receive that when we're going about saying that he was begotten or birthed or born or emanated or brought forth or whatever at some point in eternity or otherwise. Do you now see the need of a great high priest after the order of Melchizedek who had no origins? Melchizedek, Hebrew 7. However, God, however, has shown us in Revelation 12, the red dragon is at war, especially at the end of time with the remnant of the woman's seed. Why? It's over eternal, his eternal righteousness and what they're saying during the time known as the abomination of desolation. 1290. And Jesus testified to it. A future, apotelismatic, second application, second fulfillment of a 1290 in the future. Literal days. Whereas it, the first application or fulfillment already happened during the 1290 years from 554 to 1844. The first angel's warning actually equals Revelation 13.8. How? Because 13.8 is pointing you to the lamb slain in his eternal righteousness. And the first angel's warning is, is actually telling you to worship him that made. And he was eternal and relates specifically to the AOD here. And therefore, the very basis of the dragon's war with the saints is all about his eternal righteousness and the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. That is why the lamb slain is worthy to be worshipped. So this short video, and you click on that link, and it'll open a YouTube video. So you'll have an example which presents this unity consciousness in its cool slant from Gen Z. But the relevant part commences at the 8 minutes 15 to 8 minutes 55 where the interview reflects the concept concept about the universe and you are perfect just as you are now. Does that mean you need Christ? According to that, no, you don't. The fact is we do. It's funny how the advocates of unity, universal consciousness say you are perfect in sin, whereas those who should be saying we are perfect by faith in Christ's righteousness of the lamb slain and before the foundation of the world aren't having it that way either. What is God's focal point of Revelation 13? It's simple. God's focal point of Revelation 13 will sound very strange for many because everyone's complete concern about Revelation 13 is the mark of the beast and 666 and the two beasts. And as important as that may may be, what good is it going to do if you understand all that and you miss out on his eternal righteousness? So what if you can stand up and say, oh, see, look, that's the mark, mark of the beast. That's the individual whose name is, you know, the number of a man, 666. And that's what that means. And you're lost in your sins because... You don't have his garments of righteousness on, his imputed righteousness. As well as going about saying that um, he's the literal son of God. He had a starting point. (laughs) Frankly, it's a natural reaction. But when you think about it, why does verse 8 even exist in Revelation 13? let alone even need to be requited in this apocalyptic chapter. Well, God is actually saying to those who have eyes to read, the focal point of Revelation 13 is not the lion-mouthed beast with seven heads and ten horns, or the lamb-like beast, or the mark of the beast. God's focal point is verse 8, concerning the eternal righteousness of the land slain from before the foundation of the world, the first angel. Revelation 13, 8, the lamb slain and the first angel, fear God and worship him that made, 
are saying the same thing. It is faith in eternal righteousness of the Lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. And therefore, verse 7 and 8 is vital to get an appreciation of the threefold message of Revelation 14. Why? This will surprise some readers because the theology of Revelation 13, 8 and eternal righteousness transcends, as good as it was, it transcends the 1888 message of righteous by faith. Okay? 1888 and the nakedness of 1615. It is not denied. The 1888 conference on righteous by faith introduced Christ as righteousness. And it did. As the third angel's message in verity. It is repeated. That tenet is not to be denied. It's true. But here's the spoiler alert. The fact is the message of 1888 of Christ as righteousness was stained. It was stained with Aryan concepts. He had a beginning, but it's so far back, we're not going to be able to, we can't put a date on it. We can't comprehend it. It is well known the two messengers portrayed Christ as having a beginning in eternity and was then the son of God. But absent is the full spectrum of the first angel's warning. First angel's warning, worship him that made. Two in beginning, John 1.1. 1, 1. Saying the exact same thing. Let it be repeated. The fact is the message of 1888 of Christ's righteousness was stained with Aryan concepts. See, E.J. Wagner, Christ's righteousness. Click on that and opens the book. And you can see what he said. He was begotten. Oh, so far back. Look. Don't try and understand it. I'm paraphrasing. Okay, when Revelation 13, 8, an eternal righteousness of the Lamb slain from before, foundation of the world, is given consideration, you, friends, will realize the messengers of 1888, with the Arian, or even others who hold the Trinity, have no preparations to stand in this upcoming 1290 literal days, the AOD, as Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24. Why? Well, both the theologies advance the law of one. Huh? So this Arian who was begotten in, at a point in eternity, and he had a beginning in the Trinity, eternal son of God, three in one. They both advance the law of one and universal consciousness. And that's without you even knowing it. That's kind of scary. Revelation 13, 8 with John 1 and 14, 7 of Revelation establish eternal righteousness for several reasons. John 1, 13, 8, Revelation 14, 7, they're saying the exact same thing. Eternal righteousness of the eternal hologos. Firstly, the messengers of 88 focused on one immutable, which was the offspring of David. But they didn't focus on the first immutable. They had not soundly established his alpha identity before Bethlehem as eternal, and that there were two eternal divines, two eternal fathers. You can't have a literal son when Isaiah 9 says that he is eternal father number two. Yet they insisted Christ was an offspring of the father way back in eternity, so far back, minds cannot grasp. Adherents of this teaching will be left naked. What does that mean? Those who teach and preach that are gonna be left naked as written in Revelation 16, 15. Let's get to that. And as bad as that is, they have no testimony against the dragon. When the dragon is saying, denigrating his eternal deity, divinity, and dignity, his eternal righteousness, him being eternal, when the dragon, all right, is, is trampling that underfoot. The lion-mouthed beast, or even the lamb-like beast that spake as a dragon, 
how can we have a testimony against those powers when we're saying the exact same thing? Well, we can't. The dragon won't be angry or wroth with us. He'll be angry and wroth against those who are preaching the truth of John 1, 1 and 13, 8 of Revelation and 14, 7. He'll be angry and go to make war against them. And it actually says he does. Okay, he goes to make war. I'll read it. Revelation 12. Yeah, 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Testimony of Jesus Christ. That concerns his eternal righteousness, imputed righteousness. It says, which keep the commandments of God. Well, we can't do that without having Christ's righteousness imputed. So this, this has huge Okay, implications, because 1615, behold, I come as a thief, blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. If you don't have Christ's imputed righteousness, and you have this perfect pure testimony concerning Christ's eternal righteousness and his eternal identity, you're walking naked, simply put. You're not keeping your garments. Okay. So you're watching this video and you may be learning this for the first time and the light bulb goes on and you're like, wow. And that's when you start to keep your garments. Being Christian, they are a nuisance, yet not enemies of the beast. See, a Revelation 13, universal religion and accept the law of one, the doctrine of the Shema yet face the severe wrath of God. Why? See Revelation 14, 9 to 10. Secondly, some will say this matter, the lamb slain from before, banish the world. Of Revelation 13, 8 is not the omega of deadly heresies. Since Ichi White warned in 1901, the elf of deadly heresies was in their midst. It was. But the Omega would follow, and she trembled for the people. So when you think of this Omega of deadly heresies being this whole um, terrible counterfeit of Christ's true eternal righteousness and identity, saying that he had a beginning. So far back in the minds, our minds can't grasp. You have a, a terrible Omega and reason to tremble, okay? The main reason why the transcendence of eternal righteousness of Revelation 13, 8 is correct, when compared to the 1888 message of righteous by faith, is on account the main issue from Revelation 13 is a warning against the mark of the beast. So consider the mark of the beast being this false Shema. We've talked about this before which has to be contrasted with the seal of God in Revelation 7, okay? So one group is going to receive the seal of God. The other group is going to receive the mark of the beast. And the interesting thing apart, apart about that is when you understand this, the true, okay, the true in the right hand and the counterfeit in the left, when you understand this counterfeit and true Shema, and what the Shema is about, the true, that presents two in beginning, and the false Shema presents one God, denying John 1 1, Revelation 14, and Revelation 13 8 is eternal righteousness, okay, is eternal identity. It's a false which would have to be eternal righteousness of he who is the alpha. The seal of God cannot include anything other than his eternal righteousness. Christ was also eternal. Okay, and this didn't um, 
come up too well. So let me. Bear with me here. Let me go back to so you can see this. OK, so here this we printed in a prior thought paper. The Shema of Deuteronomy 6.4, and this is just a comparison. So here's the genuine over here. And here's the counterfeit. OK, so the true says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That's from the King James Version. But in the digital interlinear scripture analyzer, hear you, Israel, Yahweh Elohim of us, Yahweh Juan. Interlinear Bible, Sovereign Grace Publishers, hear, O Israel, Jehovah our God is Jehovah One. These are two key, he there, there are two key Hebrew words here. One is God, which is Elohim, which is plural, so gods. So you could read here, O Israel, the Lord, our gods, plural. And the second one is Akkad, which means oneness and duality. So the Bible conclusion, two Yahwehs, a duality, working together in perfect oneness, just like a man and his wife, though two were declared they are to be one, a cod flesh, okay? The counterfeit, hero Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and they only have modern Judaisms and professed Christianity and Laodicea has one God, monotheism. Same as the triune trinity of the little horn, the woman, which is the one behind, this is found in Isaiah 14, because he wanted to be like the most high. So he's the one behind all this, the counterfeit. And interestingly, the genuine Shema is said these words, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, Deuteronomy 6.3. So the true Shema hmm, kind of reminds you of the seal of God, doesn't it? So the seal of God. The true Shema, online hand, frontlets, and that true, Meshe, true Shema says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our gods, John 1 1. And beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, too, in beginning. Fear God, one, and worship Him that made, two, in beginning. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our gods is. A cod, a oneness and duality, two, but they work together as one. And then interestingly, the mark of the beast, the third angel warns, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his right hand, okay, from Revelation, it says right hand. True Shema. Our gods, oneness and duality, false Shema, just one God, Trinity, Arianism, emanationism, begotten, birth, born, emanated, brought forth in eternity, at some point in eternity. So in other words, he had a beginning. Is God confirming that the mark of the beast is the counterfeit Shema? Remember the first, second angel's messages are warnings warning us that the ultimate issue in the last days is over and concerning either a worship of him that made or a worship of the beast in his image. The him that made aspect concerns immediately the truth of the Godhead as revealed in the genuine Shema and verified in John 1, 1, where it says there were two in Arche in beginning, the Theos and the Logos. Okay. The mark of the beast in the right hand and forehead matches with what is stated in the Shema. But in order to get the correct definition of the Shema, one needs to properly identify the duality of one like the Son of Man flying through the clouds of the sky and approaching the Ancient of Days and is presented a kingdom. And this matches John 1.1. 1, 1. The duality of the Elohim was exactly what was presented to the high priest Caiaphas who knew Daniel 7.13. 
was about the plurality of the Elohim and had to insist otherwise in the political role of pro protagonist against he who made. And so he tore his tunic. Okay, Caiaphas therefore is the type of Second Thessalonians 2 individual and should be noted accordingly as a fake high priest. Whereas Paul identifies Melchizedek as without father or mother or genealogy as properly, as properly quoted by Paul about Jesus in Psalms 110, one to four, where this text and Paul proves that he was Melchizedek as being before David, which equals the Messianic throne of God on earth by a transcendent of David, a descendant of David, sorry. The Messiah is from days of old as presented in Micah 5.2. And add to the fact that Michael the counselor equals the Ruach Hekodesh, the Holy Spirit, as well as the Prince, a Messianic term, as well as wonderful. Also, E.G. White did not get the Godhead right in relation to the Alpha. Don't, don't, don't cringe, just, if she had, would, have Laodicea adopted the central doctrine of the little horn in fundamentals two and four? She said the truth was an advancing truth and we must walk in the increasing light. She also said she was not given the light of Christ and his righteousness, but recognized it when it was presented. Okay, further, what she was warned about the future of the omega of deadly heresies was already functioning through Arian teachings. In her day, a unity consciousness existed in the Holy Flesh movement of Indiana. If you want to know more about that, write us an email. We can send you a digital copy of the Holy Flesh movement. Both aspects have remained unrecognized as in relation to an alpha scenario of Christ, which is in fact the denial of his eternal righteousness as well as the omega, an, an omega denial. So here's the classic problem. On one occasion, E.G. White said Melchizedek was not Christ. There's the link, okay? And then later, after that, said he was in Desire of Ages. First and last things, Revelation 22, 13. The Alpha deals with the tool of reconciliation, eternal righteousness at the very commencement of the controversy before the foundation of the world. So the Alpha deals with the tool of reconciliation. His eternal righteousness at the commencement of the controversy before the foundation of the world. The Omega deals with the reconciliation, the final atonement at the end of the conflict. So the alpha equals from before the foundation of the world, the reconciliation then, the omega deals with what we're gonna experience in the final atonement at the end. Both the alpha and omega of Revelation 22, 13 and 16, which is your root and offspring of David, the alpha and the omega, deal with eternal righteousness, which at the cross was ushered in in the literal form of the slain lamb, as well as our great high priest, which equals the Omega as Melchizedek and made like the son of God because he, he takes his form of glory. Laodicea and folk in separated Laodicea do not see the terms Alpha and Omega in deeper meaning of eternal righteousness which means you won't understand what he's meaning and the meaning behind Alpha and Omega. We, we won't be able to understand it if we're going around and rehashing Arianism, a mistake that was made in 1888, the pioneers made, a mistake that Christ wasn't Melchizedek. Therefore, their viewpoints about the Alpha and Omega of deadly heresies from E.G. White, in fact, have a cloak, a choke point 
that halts any advance in awareness of eternal righteousness. The Masterpiece of Divinity series made very clear that the secret weapon of the everlasting gospel is in fact the Alpha, the Root of David, which is 2216. The Masterpiece of Divinity series was all about clarifying and bringing out and revealing the secret weapon of the everlasting gospel. His eternal identity and why he said he was the root of David, as well as the fact that the Messiah is referred to as everlasting father, possessor of eternity. And this doctrinal statement of 2216 directly strikes at the heart of the Arianism and the Trinity heresies, which states that Christ was literal son who was begotten of the father and the Trinitians, Trinitarians say the father is not the son, the son is not the father. Abish. Whereas scripture clearly states in John 14, 9, that if you have seen me, you have seen the father. Why? It's because of what is stated in Isaiah 9, 6 to 7, father of eternity. Also, what is stated as the root of David is alongside Hebrews 7 and Psalms 110, 1 to 4. Jesus said it. I didn't. For those replenished with endless doubt really ought to take note of what the angel with the third bowl of the seven last plagues says in Revelation 16, 5. So any doubts? This should clear it up. And hopefully it will. Because there is the ultimate validation of Christ's eternal righteousness. And that means that the Arianism and the Trinitarian heresies that have this three co-eternal beings, eternal son of God, begotten in eternity, brought forth, emanated, blah, blah, blah. Here's the ultimate validation of his eternal righteousness. It's stated in Revelation 13. Note the judgment of that denial of the three angels' messages is confirmed by the third angel of the seven last plagues. And I heard the messenger of the water saying, righteous. Wow. Righteous, O Lord, art thou who art and who wast and who shall be, because these things thou dost judge. There's your ultimate validation. His eternal righteousness right there in 16.5, the Elohim declaration. Revelation 16.5 confirms the eternal righteousness of the lamb slain. Lucifer never had that. This is why the deeper insights of Revelation 13.8, 22.11, and 16 addresses a major deficiency of the 1888 message of righteous by faith. What is this deeper reckoning associated unto? Well, it's the Elohim declaration found in 22.11, which this series, starting with this part one, is all about. And as with Revelation 13.8, and the angel of Revelation 16, 5, they all confirm his eternal righteousness. Why this emphasis? Simple. The only eternal righteousness that is measurable with A, the Elohim declaration of 2211, and B, the everlasting gospel. The only eternal righteousness is the eternal righteousness of Christ found here. This is what the angel of Revelation 14, 7 is saying. The eternal righteousness he had was because he too was eternal. If Christ had a beginning as claimed in 1888 and absorbed into the fundamentals, then the righteousness of Christ was never eternal. Therefore, there could be no validity to the Elohim declaration. And we would have to cut all those parts or erase them out of our Bible. And I don't know about you friends, but remember the erasable Bible, all new? Get rid of those objectionable passages? 
I don't want a Bible like that. Therefore, there could be no validity to the Elohim Declaration, let alone the existence of a Revelation 12.11 status. So what's the Revelation 12.11 status? And they overcame him, the dragon, by the blood of the lamb. There's your blood of the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world and by the word of their testimony. And they love not their lives unto the death. We cannot overcome the dragon if our testimony is denying his eternal righteousness. It's just that simple. And when you understand that, it's like, wow. Okay. And then it's your responsibility to share. And the third angel of the seven last plagues would have also have lied, but he didn't. Okay. And there you have it. So as this series continues, Bible, Bible evidence will bring fork, bring folk to a fork in the road to take the right or the left. A humbling experience to learn their interpretations of the 1888 message of righteousness by faith. Was, a was in fact a projection of self-righteousness and insufficient during the time. It's going to be insufficient during this upcoming time of AOD. Even though they had a good, had made good on the error of Aryan Gnosticism, which is the same as the Trinitarian doctrine. So it's gone a little over the, the intended, you know, keeping this to half an hour, 30 minutes. But look, I hope it helps. His eternal righteousness, his eternal identity, John 1 1, 22 11, 14 7. It's all about his eternal righteousness, proving that he was eternal, without father, without mother, without beginning of days or end of life. To say otherwise is to deny. His eternal righteousness and reject the Bible evidence. So God bless. Take care until next time. I hope this was a help. <laughs>